Hello class, today we're going to cover P.2 exponents and radicals. So I'm going to go ahead and go through this section. Um, it might seem like it's pretty long, but we'll see how far we get. Um, I may, be flip, may split this lecture into two pieces, but we'll go as far as we can go. And I probably won't extend it beyond maybe 40, 50 minutes max, okay? If it lasts that long. So let's go ahead and talk about this. So the first um, item in here is talking about integer exponents. Now remember what integers are. They're just whole numbers like one, two, three, four, five, right? But they could be positive or they could be negative, right? Each of these are all integers, okay? Once you start getting into irreducible fractions or um, decibels, then that's those are no longer integers, okay? Um, and so one of the things we know is that repeated multiplication is the definition of an expo exponent, right? So when you're multiplying three negative fours, that exponent is telling you how many negative fours to repeatedly multiply, okay? Same thing here, when you see a bunch of two x's being multiplied together, that can be shortened into the exponential form where you're just writing what is being multiplied as the base and then how many of them you are multiplying is the exponent, okay? Um, that's just the format of what a um, exponent looks like. So here's the actual definition of an exponent. It tells you that n is the exponent and n is the number of times that you multiply. And then a is the base, it's what you're multiplying, okay? Um, and exponents can be integers. So meaning that this might not just be, you know, a squared or a cubed. It could be that it's a to the negative two power or a to the negative three power, okay? And so because of that, of course, we're gonna have definitions for these expressions because what do those mean, right? We know that these mean a times a, and we know that this one means a times a times a, but what does it mean when you have a negative um, exponent, okay? And so we're gonna get to our um, properties over here on the other page. So there are many of them and they do give us examples of each one. So bear with me, I'm gonna kind of zoom in here just so that I can get it on the screen at a decent size so that we can discuss it, okay? So here we are and here's the first property. It's telling you that if you have two expressions that you need to multiply together, the way you can simplify that expression is if they have the same base, that means it's the same thing, right? That's getting repeatedly multiplied, okay? You just kind of want to use this exponent and that exponent to figure out how many of them there are total to multiply out, okay? And so the way you do that is by taking this number of times that it's multiplied out plus this number of times that it's multiplied out. For instance, if you have three squared times three to the fourth power, three squared means three times three, but then it's multiplied by three to the fourth power, which is three times three times three times three. And so you can tell there that that expression can be rewritten just by the total number of times that it's actually multiplied out. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So this can be written as three to the sixth power. And that's exactly what this rule is telling us. We're telling us that when we start with this, we will end up with three to the sixth power. And how did they get that sixth power? They just added up all the threes that you're gonna have to multiply out, okay? Similarly, it works for division, okay? If you're dividing two, two um, expressions that have the same base, then you're essentially going to subtract their exponents. They give us this example, but I always like to write it out. So if I have x to the seventh, that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then x to the fourth at the bottom would be this expression. And this expression does reduce, right? You can reduce by the same factor here. You can reduce by the same factor there, here, and here. And so then how many am I left over? I'm left with three of them, right? You have these three that need to be multiplied, okay? Um, and so you can write that as this. Now there's a shortcut. You can use this property 
and just say the top exponent minus the bottom exponent will tell you how many you have left over, okay? Not only will it tell you how many you have left over, but it'll also tell you where they're left over, okay? So for instance, this is just another example of a combination of these two. So I'm gonna talk about the combination of those two as soon as we address item three, okay? So for item three, this is the definition of a negative exponent, okay? So this is the definition of a negative exponent. That means that in order to make the exponent a positive, to change the sign of the exponent, you're basically going to change the location of that base and exponent with respect to the fraction bar, okay? So if you have a to the negative exponent as a whole number, it's like saying it's over one. And then the negative, if you want it to no longer be negative, then this whole expression will go downstairs, okay? And we always know that there's a one coefficient there, which is where that one came from, okay? And then again, there's always a one coefficient there, which is no longer written because we move the a to the end down there with it, okay? So similarly, if you have one over a to the negative n, okay, um, I can move it upstairs and it'll become a to the n, and then the coefficient here is now at the bottom. Oops, you can't see, sorry. So you've got this at negative exponent at the bottom. So in order to get rid of the negative, I had to move it to the top, and then this is still there, and that one is still there, it's just invisible, okay? And then we'll just write it formally as a to the n. So you can deal with the negative exponents just by changing the location of where it is with respect to a fraction bar, okay? So with these two together, if I talk about those two together, let's say I had the problem x to the fourth over x to the seventh. If I follow property two, that tells me I'm supposed to do four minus seven, top minus bottom. Notice that I get negative three, right? Four minus seven is going to be a negative three. However, we know from um, property three that this can be written as one over x to the positive three. So it does tell us where the x cubed is located at. So if I were to expand this, like I did its sister problem, Yes, four of them do cancel. Oops, I canceled too many. Um, but notice that you do have um, the three that are downstairs and there's always a one coefficient. So that's why there's always a one at the top, right? There's always that invisible one coefficient. Okay, so I just wanted to bring you that to your attention, that when you do the division property, um, depending on if your sign is positive, you know it's a whole, it's like this, over one, but if it's negative, then you know it's under the one, okay? So it does tell you the location of where your result will go based on the sign of that exponent, okay? Another big one is that any number to the power zero Beside zero, you can't have zero this. This is actually undefined. And if you become a great mathematician, maybe you'll be able to define that. Um, but um, for right now, it's one of those um, undefined. I think in calculus, you'll learn that it's indeterminate form. It's an indeterminate form. Like we really don't understand what's going on there. Um, it doesn't follow the sense of mathematical logic. So we know that, you know, it could possibly exist, but what it means, we don't know, okay? So this is just one of those known unknowns, um, but we don't really go with that too much. So notice that on the side, it does say that your base cannot be zero, okay? So we're not talking about zero raised to the power zero is equal to one. Anything else other than zero raised to the power one will equal one. I'm sorry, raised to the power zero will equal one. So look at this expression. You've got this really complicated expression. 
And it really doesn't matter what X is because if you add one to it, this is always gonna be a positive because even negative X values, when you multiply them times themselves, they become positive. So you've got a positive number here plus one. So I know for sure, even if X is zero, that this expression is not going to be zero ever, okay? And so you have something that will never be zero raised to the power zero, it should equal one by this definition on this property. Here's another one. You have a to the m. This expression is raised to a whole nother exponent. So you have an exponential expression raised to another exponent, okay? And so if you apply this property, it basically tells us that we should be um, multiplying these two. Now it does look like I skipped one. So let me go back real quick and then I'll cover this example with some detail. So actually number five should have been next. And all it says is that if you are multiplying two things together, if you have some factors in here, but you have an exponent that's supposed to apply to the whole expression, um, you can simply, as long as they're factors, as long as they're multiplied together, you can um, distribute sort of that um, exponent to each of them. You can apply the exponent. Distribute's not the right word. So you can apply this exponent to both factors. Now keep in mind that does not apply to problems that have a plus in the middle. These are not factors, these are terms, right? When you're separated by a plus or a minus, it's called a term. When you're separated by a multiplication, those are called factors, okay? So there's a big difference between the words terms and factors. And for rule five, they're talking specifically about fact, I'm sorry, for rule six, they're talking specifically, or five, they're talking specifically about factors, things that are multiplied together. You can apply the exponent to both of those, okay? So here they have five X cubed. And so then they're applying the cube to the five and the cube to the three. So if you type in your calculator five cubed, you'll get 125. And then if you just have X cubed, it's just simply written as X cubed, right? That's the same thing that you would get if you did 5X times 5X times 5X. It's literally what we're doing in our brains because to do this, don't we do five times five times five in our head and get the coefficient and then do X times X times X, which gives you X cubed. So you literally apply this concept a lot, even when you're just naturally doing things in your head, okay? Um, now we get to six. So we got exponential expression raised to an exponent. In this case, you're supposed to multiply the exponents. Why is that? Now I'm gonna use positives instead of the negatives just to make my point. But if I do y cubed raised to the second power, for instance, okay? The rule says I'm supposed to multiply those exponents. So three times two is six. But why is that? Remember what this is. This is y cubed times another y cubed. And that can also be expressed as y times y times y times another y times y times y, okay? And truly, how many are there? There are six total, which is why it can be written as y to the sixth, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, just like uh, property five, property seven is very similar with respect to division. So remember that division is just another way to multiply. You have to remember that this is the same thing as this, okay? You can tear this apart into two factors. It's just one of the factors will have a fraction, okay? Um, so these are, a fraction is multiplication in disguise. So I could apply that same rule from number five to a division, okay? Because if I'm trying to apply this exponent, and I've rewritten it as a product, well then according to that rule for the product, I could write a to the m over one over b to the m. And then by definition, um, you would be doing one over b times one over b times one over b. Well, all those ones multiplied together, it doesn't matter how many of them there are, you're just gonna get one. And if you're multiplying a bunch of b's, m number of them, you're gonna have b to the m. And then if you multiply this back into one fraction, you do get the AM over BM, okay? So it does work for any kind of 
um, fraction expression. And you just have to remember that fractions are multiplying. You multiply by the reciprocal, right? You multiply by the reciprocal of this B, which is one over B, okay? This little tool right here of separating fractions into factors is gonna be very important when you get to some of the stuff in this class and some of this, a lot of stuff in pre-cal, okay? When you start talking about trigonometric identities, that tool in your tool belt is gonna come in handy a lot, okay? So you will probably see me tear apart fractions many times in this class, okay? But it's just one of those things we have to remember pertaining to fractions is that fractions are just multiplications of reciprocals, okay? Um, okay. So now we're here. And so if for an example, if I have two over X cubed, I'm just basically going to cube each piece. Two cubed, I can actually compute X cubed, I cannot. So it just stays written as X cubed. And then finally, when you're taking the absolute value of, an, of a square, actually any even exponent, if this is any even exponent, whether it be square, fourth power, sixth power, it really doesn't matter. Um, you don't need to write the absolute value bars at all. Because when you square a number, no matter what the number is, it will either be zero or a positive number, okay? And so then you don't need to have the bars around an A squared. They're just unnecessary because it will already be guaranteed to be zero or positive. And by definition of an absolute value, the response should be zero or a positive value, okay? So here's an example. If you have this, we don't need to worry about the bars, we just need to compute negative two squared. And that's actually a positive four, which is the same thing you get there, okay? Okay, so let me pass this over. So now this is another important thing to mention, okay? Um, so there is a huge difference between these two expressions, okay? Um, the first one is the one that, that people will usually get correct. The second one is the one that people will usually get incorrect, okay? The first one is very obvious. You see the, that grouping mechanism, those parentheses, that's telling you that whole thing is going to get raised to the fourth power. Okay, which means that this whole thing is going to get multiplied out with four of them, right? And when you multiply all this out, we know that there, if there's an even number of negatives, your answer will be positive. If there's an odd number of negatives, you know that your answer will be negative. And if I multiply two times two times two times two, you get 16. So the result there should be positive 16, okay? which is exactly what they've shown me here. Now, the other expression though, the other expression is super important that you start to visualize it like this. There is a two that is being raised to the fourth power. The negative is just sitting there in front as that's what your sign is going to be when you're done, okay? And so the way you work that one out is it's really just, a negative symbol that's there, but only the two is being raised to the fourth power, okay? And according to that rule that I used up there, an odd number of negatives will result in a negative. And then we already know that two times two times two times two is 16. And so you end up with this result here. So it's very important that you start to recognize the difference between when the parentheses are around the negative and when the parentheses are not around the negative, okay? That will be one of the most common errors that will occur. So of course they want us to try to use all of those properties, right? Um, to simplify each of these expressions. Now, every problem is different. There's no possible way to cover every single situation that could possibly happen. So you really have to familiarize yourself with those properties, okay? Um, if you need to make a note card so that you have them handy so that you can recall them when you need to, but these properties are going to play 
throughout the rest of your math career. Okay. And they're not something that's going to go away. The whole course, really, everything in here that we do, you will use at some point when you're in pre cal, when you're in calculus, um, or even the higher calculus classes, even some of the engineering classes. Okay. So this information is stuff that should eventually you want to memorize because it should be stuff that comes like second nature to you like when you're asked to multiply things or divide things that should be like writing it down that's how simple it should be as, as simple as you copying something down that's how simple it should be to compute um exponents and to simplify exponents okay so let's go ahead and work with this one now with this i don't necessarily rewrite all of this out because if these have super high exponents um it, this might not be the best thing to do. Or if I have more than just two terms, this might not be the best. I don't prefer to organize it this way. Um, there is a rule, it's called the commutative rule, that when you have two things multiplied together, um, it doesn't matter what order you multiply them in, you will still get the same result, right? This is called the commutative property. Commutative, there we go. And that uh, commutative property is for addition and multiplication, okay? Not for subtraction or division because it does make a difference whether the number's on the top or the bottom, right? We have a prime example of division, actually. I just covered it right here. We had um, x to the seventh on top and x to the fourth on the bottom, and we ended up with this result. And then here we swapped them, and we had a totally different result, okay? So make sure that you're aware um, that division and subtraction are not commutative, okay? Only addition and multiplication. Okay, so the way I organize it is, is I like to put my numbers multiplied together. Then I like to put um, my letters multiplied together. And then I like to put my other letter multiplied together. So this is how I group them, okay? And some people use parentheses for the letters and some people don't, that is completely up to you. But I definitely make a point to write the, ver the, the similar variables, the similar bases together, okay? Similar bases there together. And so then when I multiply the numbers, you get this negative 12. When you have a times a, we already know that that can be written as a squared. And when we have b to the fourth times b to the negative three, we simply need to add those exponents together, which gives us a positive one. So we will have b with the positive one exponent. However, we know that we don't ever write positive one exponents. They're just understood to be positive one when the variable is present, but there's no exponent. Now here, we're going to apply the rule where we're going to apply this exponent to every single term with a base, okay? Now think of it this way, two has a base of one. I mean, sorry, two has a base of two, but an exponent of one. X has a base of X and an exponent of one. And this term or this factor has Y as the base and two is the exponent. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to multiply this three to all of those exponents. Okay, so I usually don't do this. I do two exponents raised to exponents means you multiply. Exponent raised to an exponent means you multiply. And exponent raised to an exponent means you multiply. And then the only thing left is to actually figure out what two cubed is. And once you figure out that it's eight, your final answer is just eight X cubed um, Y to the six, okay? So let's see what we have on number or letter C. Letter C is tricky. Remember we mentioned that anything to the power zero is one. So notice that they just said the whole thing to the power zero is gonna be this one. Even if you had applied the zero to each piece, you would have had three A, negative four to the power zero and a squared to the power zero. So you would have ended up with a times one times another one, 
which still would have given you the expression 3a, okay? Um, why do they mention that a cannot be zero? Because we already know that a squared to the power zero means I have to multiply those, so I get zero. And we already know that this does not equal one when a equals zero, because zero to the zero does not equal one, right? That was the one that was undefined, okay? But that's the reasoning why they have this statement here, okay? Um, it's not going to equal 3a no matter what a is, because if a is zero, it doesn't equal anything. There's just no, no answer, okay? If they tell you to evaluate this expression for when a is equal to zero, you wouldn't be able to tell them the answer. You would have to write undefined or does not exist because we don't have an answer for that one, okay? It just has not been defined yet, okay? And there are a lot of indeterminate forms. So if your like brain is, you know, blown because this is not defined, um, we already know that this is not defined, right? Whenever you had one over zero, didn't we always tell you this is undefined? And so when you were working with fractions, if you ever had the zero at the bottom, we knew it was undefined. And this is how I remember, um, it's okay if the zero's on top, but it's no, not okay when the zero's at the bottom, okay? When the zero's at the bottom, it's just undefined. But there are more and more and more. When you get to calculus, they're gonna talk about all the indeterminate forms, but there are lots of them. It's not just this one that's new and then that one that's old. There's a bunch of numbers like that um, that are just indeterminate. We can't tell you the value with those numbers in those positions. We cannot tell you the value. Okay, and then the last example was this fraction here. So notice you do still have an external exponent. So that external exponent does need to get applied to everything inside the um, parentheses. So notice that the five is getting squared, the x cubed is getting squared, and the y at the bottom is getting squared, okay? For me personally, I probably would have put parentheses around this but it doesn't matter. Five squared is 25. If you multiply the exponents, according to that exponent raised to an exponent rule, you get six. And then here it's just y times y, which is y squared. Okay. So those are some examples of um, simplifying these uh, exponential expressions. Okay. So we are about what, 25 minutes in? Yeah, about 25, 26 minutes in. We'll keep going a little bit more and see how much further we can go. Um, I think, look how quick, if you're paying attention, how many pages there are in this thing. There's lots and lots and lots of pages. So we're just going to keep going through it. And if we need to split it into two, then I'll do that. Okay. So now we're going to start talking about the radicals because we it's a lot of information just with the exponents, okay? And hopefully you you have a little bit of experience with that. If not, then definitely practice in the homework assignment um, those exponent rules, okay? But we will keep using them throughout the entire rest of the semester. So you'll hear me or see me refer to them every now and then, okay? Um, but the next ones are what are called radicals. And radicals are anything that have this little symbol, okay? Now, there might be no number in it. There might be a number there. There might be, you know, all kinds of numbers. But, but that's what a radical is. It has that little, like, house, almost like a division symbol, but with this little hook on it, okay? So they're going to pop up everywhere. Um, we were seeing those, this symbol the square root symbol, right? We saw it when we were solving uh, equations by extracting roots, okay? So square roots is nothing new. We've been doing them. Um, but it, a square root of a number is basically one of the equal factors, okay? So for example, 25, the square root of 25 is five because five is one of those equal factors, right? 
if you say a square is when you have one factor times itself to give you a result. This is called a perfect square. And half of its common factors would be just the five, okay? And so that's one of the two equal factors. Now, similarly, we can do the same thing for a cube root. It's just gonna be one of the three equal factors. So for 125, that can be written as five times five times five. So if I'm doing the cube root of 125, I just wanna know what is the number that was multiplied over and over again, three times, and that was the five. Okay, um, it says, let A and B be real numbers and let N be an uh, exponent greater or equal to two. So this exponent has to be two, three, four, five, anything bigger, okay? and does have to be a positive integer. If um, then b is the nth root of a, when n equal to two, the root is a square root. When n equals three, the root is a cube root. Essentially what they're saying is that if I wanted to solve this, we know that the opposite of exponents are radicals. So I could apply the nth radical to this expression on both sides of the equation. And then we know that the index and the exponent will cancel. And so you still have the nth root of A. So that's what it's saying. It's saying B is the nth root of A. B is the nth root of A. And if this N is equal to two, then that's called a square root. And we never write the two for a square root. It's kind of like the invisible one coefficients. It's just invisible, okay? And then when n equals three, it would be a cube root and so forth, okay? So of course, there's gonna be some properties of radicals, right? Um, it says some numbers have more than one nth root. For example, both five and negative five are square roots of 25. The principal square root of 25 is written as the square root of 25 is the positive root five. This was kind of tying into what I mentioned where when we were so extracting roots, I told you that if the expression was already written with a square root, then if it's a positive expression, no sign in the front, then you're only going to get the positive result. If my problem that was given to me had a radical already in it and it had a negative, then I knew that this was the negative square root. That is different from when you have x squared equal to 25 and you introduce the square root. There was no principal square root to begin with. You decided to take the square root, okay? And when you decide to take the square root, you, that is where you end up getting um, both of the types of square roots for that number, okay? And so then we ended up getting the plus and the minus five, okay? So just keep in mind, if square, if the, the radical symbol is already in the problem before you manipulate anything, you've got to keep whatever sign it says, and that's the only sign of the root that you'll get. But if it never had square roots to begin with and you introduce them, then you get both um, roots, okay? So it says um, the principal nth root of, in, of A is the nth root that has the same sign as A. It is denoted by a radical symbol. The positive integer n greater than or equal to two is the index. So this guy is called the index, okay? Um, and then A is called the radicand. So radicand is what's on the inside of that um, radical, okay? So the radical symbol is this, okay? The number that goes on the front is called the index, and then whatever's inside is called the radicand. So again, this is the statement. If you have a square root and this is what you were given, you do not get both answers, okay? If you were given just this, then because this is positive in the front, the result is positive. Because this one is negative in front, the result is negative. But be very careful. 
because the cube root of this is actually a negative two. Why? Because negative two times negative two times negative two equals negative eight. And if I were to write this instead, right, that would be negative two to the power three. So instead of writing the cube root of negative eight, I could write the cube root of negative two third cubed. And then the cube and the index would cancel and I just end up with the negative two, okay? So this is just side work, don't worry about that. My point is, is that the cube root of negative eight equals a negative two. But if I had the negative cube root of negative eight, you have to remember that this sign has to be part of the answer, but I already know that the cube root of negative eight is negative two. So if I multiply those two signs together, I actually end up with a positive two for this expression. So be very careful. I know the wording that I used might be confusing, okay? Just because there's a positive here doesn't necessarily mean that the final answer is going to be positive, okay? And just because it's negative here doesn't mean the final answer will be negative. What it does tell me is that at least for the first step, it will still be there, okay? And this one's positive. And for the first step, this will still be there. However, I did not need to simplify this anymore. So it just so happened to have the same sign. Same thing here. Once I moved this and I took the square root, I didn't need to simplify it anymore. So it just stayed positive two. Whereas this one, once it's simplified, I did have to simplify further. And so this one resulted into a positive two. So I definitely wanted to make sure I brought your attention to that. Okay. So it says, here are some generalizations about the nth roots of real numbers. So the first thing is, is that as long as your base is positive, okay, the radicand, I'm sorry, as long as the radicand or the inside is greater than zero, and the index is even. So remember, n is the little number that goes there. If that guy is even, so if you have a positive number on the inside and this is even, um, we know that whatever this sign is, is gonna be the sign of the answer. And whatever that sign is, that's gonna be the sign of the answer, okay? But now here, as long as it doesn't equal zero, it doesn't matter whether it's greater than zero or less than zero. It doesn't matter whether the inside is positive or whether the inside is negative, just as long as the inside's not zero, okay? and n is odd, then that means that whatever sign is on the inside will be the sign that you get on the outside, okay? Now that's not to say like if you had a negative out here, that negative is gonna combine with the negative on the inside and you end up with a positive. I already showed an example of that with the negative cube root of negative eight. Now, what happens if we have a negative value on the inside? Those with an even root, like a square root, fourth root, so on and so forth, there's no answer to that. That's not a real number, okay? Those are what are called imaginary numbers or complex numbers, and that is the, the next section that we'll cover, okay? But for now, we would not be able to simplify an expression like that. We would just say not a real number, okay? Once we finish 1.5, we'll no longer be able to say not a real number although we will say it, <laughs> it just won't be our final answer um, that we type in. Okay, so integers such as one, four, nine, 16, 25, and 36 are called perfect squares um, because they do have integer square roots, meaning positives or negatives. Similarly, these integers are called perfect cubes because of the same reason, they have perfect integer cube roots. Um, so just like with the exponents, we have lots of rules for, or lots of properties for radicals as well, okay? The first property here is that when you're taking the nth root, this is the index, and an exponent, um, it doesn't matter whether that exponent on the inside is inside the radical or completely outside of the radical. You do get the same result. 
Okay. So for instance, this one says the cube root of eight squared, that can be simplified as the cube root of eight squared, which is the cube root of eight is two and two squared is four. Now, if I would have taken it from here, if I square the eight, I get the cube root of 64. And it just so happens that the cube root of 64 is also four and notice those are the same, okay? Now, when you multiply radicals, you may combine them as long as they have the same index, this inside can get multiplied with that inside on the inside, okay? So if you have radical five times radical seven, you can multiply the two in, uh, radicands together um, to get the square root of four, 35. Similarly for division, if you're, they both have the same index, you can just write one giant radical for the fraction, okay? So an example here is the fourth root of this, the fourth root of that, it can be simplified like this, okay? And then 27 divided by nine is just three. Now, if you try to work on it on your own, um, let me see, I don't think that's gonna have anything. Yeah, I mean, I can do it, but it might be complicated because you definitely need to know something that you don't know yet. So I can show you or verify that this is true, that this does equal the fourth root of three, but you're gonna kind of have to believe something. No, not really. Um, what is this three times nine, right? I think I can do it just with the properties we've been given. Now I can go backwards, right? These are equivalent. So if I have two things that are multiplied inside, I can certainly separate them. So I can say the cube root of three times the cube root of nine. Is this the cube root? It's not even the cube root. Where did I get cube root from? I'm telling you, you see too many numbers in a day and they just start all melding together. <laughs> So here we go, fourth root of nine and fourth root of nine will actually wipe each other out. So you do get that fourth root of three as your result, okay? So it does work even without using this property, just using the property one, you can prove that, that it is true, okay? Now what happens, this has happened before. What happens if you have the radical of a radical, okay? All that means is that now those two, indexes will get multiplied together. So think of this, you've got the cube root and a square root, so there's an invisible two, and if you multiply those together, you get the sixth root. Now that one, I cannot show you why until we learn another property, okay? And I'm pretty sure it's gonna come up because I know that there are some questions in the homework assignment that have to do with it. So let me just verify before I keep going. Um, yes, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna be a while before we get to that. So I think I am going to need to split this section into two, okay? But let me keep going with these properties. We'll go over the examples on the next page and then I'll stop this video. So once I learn that rule, I'll be able to verify this. But for now, understand that if you're taking the double radical of a number, you do just multiply those indexes together. Um, here's another one that I've been using a lot, right? When the index and the exponent match, you no longer need the square root or any of those indexes or exponents. It's just the base all by itself, okay? We've been using that property a lot already, but it is truly a property, okay? Just like when you want to get rid of a square root, you square. If you wanna get rid of a square, you take the square root, okay? Um, and then when you're doing the even radicals of numbers, okay? Um, if this is even and this is even, you have to have the absolute value bars, okay? Um, but when this is odd and this is odd, then you do not have to have the absolute value bars, okay? Um, the idea is, is that when you're taking the square root of um, four, you get two answers, plus and minus, right? And so 
they ask you to take the absolute value of it so that you can make sure that you just get the positive version, okay? Whereas this one, um, when you take the, let's say the cube root, because that's an odd index of negative eight, you do get the same um, value, okay? So this can be written as negative two squared cubed, I'm sorry. And so you get the negative two. Whereas this can be written as the square root of negative two squared, but you don't get negative two, okay? You just don't. You only get the positive two. That's why the bars are there, okay? Um, it's basically the mathematicians had to decide which one to go with, okay? Because we know that there's two solutions, but if the radical was present at the beginning, you've got to choose which one is going to be the answer, okay? And so then they chose to take the positive. So you have to have absolute value. Now, it also prevents you from taking the square root of a negative. And we know that if you take the square root of a negative, it's imaginary, right? We talked about that. So here it says, use the properties of radicals to express, um, simplify each expression. So I do know that if I'm multiplying two radicals, I can multiply their radicands, which would give me square root of 16. And square root of 16 is four because four times four equals 16, right? Then here um, I can use that property that tells me that whether the cube is on the outside or the inside, it makes no difference. And so if I do that, I have this. And then we have the other property that says the cube, the index and the cube should wipe each other out, leaving me with just the five, okay? And because it was a cube root, I don't have to have any absolute value bars on this, okay? Now, here it's the same thing. They cancel each other out and I just get X. And because it's a cube, an odd index, I do not need absolute value bars. However, here the sixes will cancel, but I do need the absolute value bars around the Y um, to ensure that we have positives, right? That we get the positive answer and not the negative answer. So even index, you use the bars for variables. Odd exponents, you do not need to use the bars. And so those are the examples. And so then I'm going to stop the video here, but I will resume the video and start discussing how to simplify radicals, okay? Um, so I will continue in just a bit.